Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Road to Recovery group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Linda, and I'm an alcoholic. Could everyone please turn off your mobile phones or switch them to a silent profile, and please try to keep disruptions to a minimum. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. In view of our singleness of purpose, we would respectfully ask that sharing be confined to alcoholics, and when discussing our problems, we confine ourselves to those problems as they relate to alcoholism. There may be visitors here who are unfamiliar with our tradition of anonymity. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio and television. This tradition is a constant reminder that personal ambition has no place in AA. We are sure that anonymity is the greatest safeguard Alcoholics Anonymous can ever have. We therefore seek your cooperation in protecting the anonymity of our members at the public level. The format of tonight's meeting will be two 10-minute speakers, followed by a third and final speaker until approximately 9 o'clock. Can we have a moment's silence to remember Tradition 5? Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Thank you. Our first two speakers tonight will be Mike and Catherine. My name's Michael, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> to any newcomers out there, I know you're thinking, it just looks too smooth to be an alcoholic. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, It's not always been that way. I come in and I've obviously got what my sponsor's got today. And uh, um, I've obviously got some of what my dad's got as well. I don't know what, but something's obviously uh, in the genes. Um, But I sat down there earlier and uh, Linda said, I can't wait. can't wait for the night. Well, obviously not. Forget about chapter five. Let's get it on. (laughs) Um, I feel that I'm one of the luckiest men alive today, you know what I mean, to be given this second chance at life. Um, don't happen often, you know what I mean, a lot of my friends are dead or doing long prison sentences, and uh, I remember the days being sat in prison cells, living day to day an existence of um, unemployment, violence, um, just living a dark, in a dark, dark world, you know what I mean? So I do feel like one of the luckiest men alive today to be stood here and carrying a message, you know what I mean? And knowing that, in what I say, I actually have the power to save people's lives, you know what I mean? And uh, I take sharing, I take a message of, of Alcoholics Anonymous very, very, very seriously, you know what I mean? Because it is, in what we say, we can save lives. And, and in what we say, we can also have the power to kill as well, you know what I mean, and um, uh, this message of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the lifeblood of our fellowship, you know what I mean, this is what makes our fellowship grow, is how we carry this message to the new man that walks through these doors, and um, before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I tried everything to stop drinking, Um, I tried doctors, counselors, I I was reading a bit in, in the basic text, I think it's in the chapter, there is a solution, that doctors, psychiatrists, they seem to find it impossible to make us discuss our situation without reserve. 
uh, to get honest. You know what I mean? We can't get honest with these people. And it goes on to say, and even more so with, with fre- intimate friends, family. Um, I wouldn't even get close to discussing my problems with friends or, uh, well, family, loved ones. You know what I mean? And then it goes on to say in, in the paragraph, but a, like, the man sat in a meeting armed with the facts about his condition can generally win the confidence of another alcoholic within a couple hours. And um, that this man that's approaching the newcomer, his, his whole deportment shouts, he is a man with, with, with an answer. And that was, mate, I tried everything to stop drinking. Doctors, counsellors, psychiatrists, self-will, um, just everything. And uh, when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time, I, I saw, I felt, and I believed that there was something in that room that night that was going to help me recover from this illness. You know what I mean? That these people, these people in, in that room that evening, they talked my language. I mean, they'd been to the places where I'd been, and yet they'd found a way out. And um, I remember going home, you know what I mean, and, and just knowing I was on, onto something special. You know what I mean? For the first time in my life, I realised that I wasn't special, I wasn't different, I was just an average alcoholic, like the people that was in that room. And that I was never very good at mathematics, but simple mathematics told me that um, if I'd done what these people had done then why shouldn't I get the same results? And that, and that was it. You know what I mean? I threw myself in. I was doing six, seven meetings a week. And from that day on, you know what I mean, from getting kicked out of a treatment centre on, like, the Wednesday to coming here on the Friday and a day at a time not having another drink um, for nearly 12 years now, you know what I mean, blows me away. Uh, the peace and serenity that... That, that I feel in my life today is second to none. You know what I mean? Not even Valium gave me that. You know what I mean? <laughs> By the potload. And uh, I always talk about milestones in, in recovery. You know what I mean? I, I, I arrived in recovery with absolutely nothing. You know what I mean? With absolutely nothing. I was living at my mum and dad's house. I think I just got out of prison again. I was up in the loft. I'd never had a job. Uh, I had a couple of bin liners of clothes, that was it. I come into recovery, got Wayne as a sponsor, started to crack on, and I was told that alcohol is just a symptom. You know what I mean? The main problem centers in the mind of the alcoholic. And probably no human power could relieve us, relieve us of our alcoholism. Um, and that this 12-step program is probably the only thing that, that can save me f- from from the gates of insanity and death. This uh, spiritual awakening that's talked about in the 12th step. Transformation of thought and attitude, personality change. And um, I started to work through this 12 step program within, within weeks. <coughs> the first milestone was waking up, doing my suggestions, and later on in the day thinking, but yeah, I haven't even thought of a drink today. You know what I mean? For the first time in years and years. That was the first little milestone. And then just going through the steps with, with my sponsor, little milestones there, completing each one after each one, just feeling better and better and better. You know what I mean? Buzzing, buzzing. I, I didn't have no sleep for like six, seven weeks where I was like withdrawing. And I, yeah, I was phoning my sponsor saying, I, I, I still haven't had no sleep, I said, but I'm feeling brilliant. You know what I mean? I'm feeling brilliant. And normally I, I had the same two fears as I think it's Dr. Bob. A fear of not getting any sleep and a fear of running out of drink. If I didn't have no drink, I wouldn't sleep. It, it, you know what I mean? If I didn't sleep, it's because I didn't have no drink. And yet I was in recovery with a list of suggestions, a sponsor, people around me, doing these things, not sleeping, and I, I was feeling brilliant. You know what I mean? I could feel the power that's talked about in the second tradition. I mean, it's loving God as he expresses himself in our group conscience. I could feel that in that meeting. I could feel it working in my life and uh, each step I'd done I just felt better and better and better and I remember wishing there was like 101 steps at the time you know what I mean it was brilliant um, 
doing my first step nines and my sponsor telling me about the time I got a job and thought he was punishing me. And uh, I think I was, I was doing so well and getting a job, you know what I mean? And, and another milestone, I remember bumping into uh, a copper dog handler and, uh, in a O and I used to work on the roads and jumping out, just paranoid for some reason that he thought I was up to no good again. And having to explain to him that I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of the 12-step program. <laughs> and uh, my facial expressions, last time I told that story, Nick Kay, he told me to mention him anyway, so I killed two birds. He said it <laughs> wasn't good. But uh, the copper and the dog was like that. <laughs> Just... And it's like what Dr. William Siltworth turned around and said to Bill W. I don't know what's happened to you, Michael, but whatever it is, you best hold on to it because anything is better than the way of life that you was living. You know what I mean? So fair play to you. And um, going on, you know what I mean? Meeting a lady, taking that lady out, getting married in recovery. All the men is the same, you know what I mean? Especially in the summer, all getting lusted up with all the ladies walking around with next to nothing on. I remember moaning to me sponsor, oh, I'm never going to meet no one, oh, nobody's going to want me. I know I'm smooth, but I'm fat. <laughs> I know I'm smooth and good looking, but I'm fat, nobody's going to want me. But, um, and he said, look, just keep doing what you're doing, it, it will all fall into place. And I, for one, can't wait to be at your wedding. And, uh, he took, the, he took my wedding photos, you know what I mean? I had people in recovery there on my wedding day, brilliant. I've had two little girls in recovery, you know what I mean? That just, they are, they are my life today, you know what I mean? Uh, I can be a father to my son today. Um, and setting up my own business, all these things. You know I, mean? I remember being sat in prison with nothing, you know what I mean? I don't say these things that say, look at me, you're not good. Because all these things is on higher purchase from this fellowship. You know what I mean? I've got to work at deserving recovery. I've got to work at deserving my life today. You know what I mean? At times like this, this group needs me. I'll dig deep. I'll do whatever I can for this group. I used to get upset in the early days. People cross-sharing about my group. I remember I grabbed a little cockney old. Not that I've got nothing against Londoners. Some of you are my best, <laughs> some of you are my best friends today. And he would always share against my group. And he was always sharing put my group down, put my group down. So as he was walking past, I grabbed him. I said, when you get home tonight, son, I said, you want to get down on your knees and thank your higher power for my group? And he's gone, why is that? I said, because my group's not only saved my life, it's just saved your bloody life as well. <laughs> my name's Catherine, I'm an alcoholic. Um, it was really hard to follow Mike and um, I was just sort of sat there listening and I was just um, thinking about, um, I don't know, just the great examples of Alcoholics Anonymous that we've got in this group really and, um, you know, I do just love this group, I love my home group and um, I'm very grateful to be sober and my sobriety day is the um, 15th of April 1996. And um, I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, a miserable, suicidal wreck. wasn't quite as bad as Mike, but I did stop drinking when I was 18, so I think maybe if I'd carried on a bit longer, I think the, you know, the prisons and that might have been there for me as well. Um, well, I say I wasn't as bad, I mean, but I felt, do you know what I mean, as bad. I mean, that's the thing. When you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you listen to people share and, you know, they say, you know, simple cliche, listen to similarities and not the differences, because you will, you'll hear people share and, you know, some people have been worse than you. Maybe some people haven't been as bad as you. But I remember when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, the thing that, that sort of really grabbed me was when people were talking about how they felt. And when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean... I don't think I could have felt any worse. Do you know what I mean? I absolutely hated myself with a vengeance. I, um, I couldn't. The thought of... And people used to say to me as well, oh, your teenage years, best years of your life. And I used to think, my God, it's going to get worse. You know, it was just... It was horrible. And I, you know, and I was such an alcoholic. And, you know, the longer I go on in Alcoholics Anonymous, the more I realise how much of an alcoholic I was. I never in my life just had one drink, ever. I always ended up absolutely paralytic. As soon as I had one drink, that was it. I had to get absolutely paralytic. Um, I never felt right before I started drinking. 
Um, I never felt like I fitted in, never felt a part of, you know, I've learnt now I was chronically self-centred and I couldn't talk to people and that. And, and I, as the first time I went out and got drunk, I just absolutely loved it. I loved the effects of alcohol right from the start. I mean, alcohol did something to me that it does not do to normal people. And I heard somebody share, and I quite often use this because it just, it, it, you know, it just describes perfectly what it was like for me. And I remember Cindy Coleman when she shared this meeting, she said for her, when having a drink, it was like, it was just like, you know, everything was all right. And, and that is what it was like for me. It was like, as soon as I had a drink, it was just like, you know, everything was all right. If I could just have a drink, you know, I'd have all these fears and resentments and... I'd feel this feeling uncomfortable and just feeling bad and I could just get a drink, do you know what I mean? And the problem was I'd start drinking, I couldn't stop, I'd end up in, a, in awful situations, end up having consequences. Right from the start I was having consequences from my drinking. So then I had consequences from my drinking. So not only am I someone who can't fit in with life, doesn't feel a part of, I then start drinking, can't stop drinking, have loads of consequences. So then when I sober up I might feel in ten times worse because I've got all this guilt and remorse and shame about what I've done on top of not feeling like I fitted in and it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And the more I drank, the more consequences I got, the worse I felt, the more I had to drink, the more consequences I got and it was horrendous. And I just thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous and um, I mean I'd been in trouble with the police. Um, different things, oh, it was just a mess and I tried so many ways to sort me out and I just couldn't sort me out. And um, I arrived here via a treatment centre and I spent seven and a half months in a treatment centre, well two treatment centres, went to a primary one and then a secondary one and that's how I ended up in Plymouth. I spent six months having intensive group therapy, one-to-one -one counselling, inner child work, you name it, I had it. And um, I left the treatment centre and I felt worse. And that's no reflection on the treatment centre. It's just that I'm an alcoholic described in the basic text of alcoholics. So it's the type of alcoholic I am. I am selfish and self-centred to the extreme. And that is my problem. Self-pity is to the extreme. And um, I'm an alcoholic. That's all I am. I mean, thank God I know I'm an alcoholic. And... Um, I left the treatment centre, I was going to meetings every single day, and I urge you know, go to meetings and get a sponsor. And, I mean, if you knew, be really careful when you choose a new sponsor. I mean, the first couple of sponsors I had didn't have a sponsor, I hadn't been through the 12 steps properly, and, um, and I felt awful. And I used to come to meetings, and, um, you know, I used to hear Chapter 5 read out at every meeting, and, um, you know, I used to listen to the bit where it says... Um, you know, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, you know, and it says, but there are those with grave emotional mental disorders, and I'd sit in the meeting, and i think, maybe I'm one of those people with a grave emotional mental disorder, you know, maybe that's what's wrong, maybe that's why it's not working for me. And then it says, you know, even they can recover if they have the capacity to be honest. I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm not being honest, maybe, but I think I'm being honest, I don't know what I'm not being honest about, and... I remember sitting in meetings and I was just getting worse and worse. And the longer I came away from that last drink, the worse I was feeling. And, um, and it says, and I love the doctor's opinion in the big book as well, when it says, you know, you know, it says, you know, some people make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Because I felt like I was fighting, do you know what I mean? That self-will run, right, just trying to hang on to sobriety because... I knew I was alcoholic and I knew I couldn't drink again, but doing this life business and staying sober just felt impossible and unbearable, do you know what I mean, with all this crap that I had going on in my head and how bad I felt. And thank God, I mean, I, mean, I stumbled across this meeting and um, I remember the first time I came here and I saw the sign on the wall that says misery is optional and I thought, how dare you? How dare you tell me misery is optional after what I've been through in my life? Do you know what I mean? Because I've been through hell. And, um, but I remember sitting in that meeting and I didn't like it. I actually didn't like the meeting. I, everybody frightened me. Do you know what I mean? I just felt intimidated by everybody because they were coming up and shaking my hand and... And I really, I, I really didn't like it. But there was something here, do you know what I mean? People, when people started to share, and they started to share what it used to be like, what they'd done, and what the life was like now. So when they started to and I started to listen, something kept me coming back, do you know what I mean? And I used to sit in this meeting, and um, there was another thing, I mean, something else that, that started to see somebody share a lot, but there's another thing that really clicked for me as well. He's like, I used to sit in the meeting, and I used to think, yeah, it's all right for you lot. Do you know what I mean? But somehow my case is different. Somehow this just isn't going to work for me. You don't know how sick I am. You don't know I've tried everything. Do you know what I mean? This just isn't going to work for me. And I just thought I was never going to feel any peace of mind. And I thought I was never going to feel better. 
But eventually, thank God, do you know what I mean? I, I, just, I had nowhere else to go. I had nothing else to do. And I just got a sponsor. And I was willing to do whatever it took to stay sober. And I thank God for that. Do you know what I mean, I just thank God that I had step one and that I was beaten enough and I felt so bad. You know, they call it, they do call it the gift of desperation. And, and I was just so grateful that I just felt so bad. And I mean, I was 18 when I arrived in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think I was 19 when I came to this group. And, um, and the other thing I love about this group as well is like, I mean, I was so young, and it was nearly all men. There was a couple of women, and, um, but it was nearly all men. But I was just so looked after in this group. Do you know what I mean? I, you know, I was able to grow up in, in Alcoites, and I was able to grow up in this group. And, you know, I just, and, and this is, you know, it, it is the safest place in the world for me to be is in this meeting of Alcoites Anonymous. And, you know, I just, just really love it. I mean, the, you know, I was like sort of thinking about the good examples that are in here. And, you know, it's just a, a group of absolute gentlemen. And, um, and we've got loads of girls now as well, which is just brilliant, you know, and I just love that as well. Um, anyway, so I got this sponsor and I was willing to do whatever it took. And um, I got given really basic, simple suggestions to do. And, and I just did them. I had no problem. I had no problem getting on my knees in the morning and asking for a sober day. I had, and I just did it. I had no problem getting to my home group at half past six. I had no problem doing service. I had no problem ringing my sponsor every day. I, you know, I just got on with it and I just did it um, because I didn't want to die. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it hasn't always been like that. I mean, I've had my moments in recovery where I've had bits of self-will. You know, I mean, usually been a bloke involved somewhere along the line, which seems to be the thing that takes most people out there, the relationship problem. But... Um, <laughs> But I just have always done it. When my back's been against the wall, I've just always done. And some people, and it makes me so sad in Alcoholics Anonymous, some people would rather die than follow a few simple rules. There is an answer to all your life problems in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, you may come in, you, you know, people may think, oh, it's just a bunch of drunks, you know, sat around. The, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous isn't. There is something so special on offer in Alcoites Anonymous, you know, if you're just willing to pay the price, and the price isn't that high, you know, you just need to do certain things, and, you know, you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams, and um, I've certainly got a life beyond my wildest dreams. I've not always gone the way I've wanted it to go. I'm waiting for all my milestones. I'm waiting to meet the husband and have the kids, but <laughs> I'm sure it'll happen, and... Um, but I just love Alcoites Anonymous, and um, it's a privilege to share, and I'll shut up there, and hand over to Bob, thanks. I would now like to introduce tonight's final speaker, Bob. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Bob, I am alcoholic. <laughs> Only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in that I've accessed through good sponsorship and a 12-step process outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and a persistent and consistent commitment to the primary purpose of helping other drunks. I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion-altering substance since October 31st, 1978. And for that, I owe you my freedom in my life. And I say freedom because abstinence without freedom isn't really worth very much. I know what it's like to quit drinking and feel like I'm doing time. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Last time I was here, most of the guys had dresses on. It was very, <laughs> very strange. Uh, I had kind of gotten it out of my mind through three months of hypnotherapy, but it kind of <laughs> came back tonight a little bit, and uh, I may not sleep tonight. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Prior to, uh, on, on, prior to getting sober the last time in 1978, on my last drunk, I tried to take my own life. And I had uh, been drinking for a number of days, and I came to one morning, and I just couldn't go on anymore. A doctor had told me that prior year in a, in a hospital that I was, I was in my 20s, that I was young enough and physically fit enough that I could go on like I was going on physically for another five or ten more years, maybe. And it was horrible. And I could not imagine that. And I don't know how the thing that had been so glorious 
the effect of alcohol, that it, what it did for me at one time, how it could turn on me so drastically. But it did. And I was at that place where my drinking was pathetic, and I drank and felt sorry for myself, and I drank in abject loneliness, and I drank and could not even drink away the re feelings of remorse and, and shame that I'd felt for some of the horrible things I'd done to the people who loved me. And yet I couldn't imagine life without it either. I got sober many times. And when I stop drinking, I suffer from these low-level depressions. And they're not really depression. I'm not sure what they are. And the reason I, don't, I know they're not depression is I've gone to the, the absolute finest psychiatrist in America and was treated for depression, and their treatment didn't work. Oddly enough, it, was, it wasn't clinical depression. It was spiritual depression. And the reason I know that, it wasn't until I applied the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous and the actions we take here that the depression went away. It never went away from the medicine and the therapy because it wasn't, re it looked like clinical depression. And I could, and every time I quit drinking, abstinence eventually feels like I'm doing time. And I, uh, I'm stuck in a trap I cannot spring. I can't imagine life going on the way it was going on. And yet I can't imagine life without it either. It's really a dilemma. And I'm on that I got this bottle that morning, not, not so much to get drunk. I really got the bottle for courage, and I went to a bridge with the intention of uh, making this stop. I had been going through a series of sprees and remorse for a lot of years now. I'd been in a lot of institutions. I'd been to therapy. I'd been to treatment. I'd been to church. I'd been hypnotized. I'd, I'd, I did crazy things. I, I, I mean, crazy stuff. I had a therapist one time do primal therapy on me. He had me lay on the ground and kick my hands and feet and scream, Mommy, Daddy. I mean, oh, jeez. I mean, shock, uh, carbon dioxide shock treatments. Crazy stuff. And I, I when it says in our book, uh, no human power could relieve our alcoholism, I, I know that. You know why I know it? Because I tried everything that ever popped up on the radar. And I am at the end of my rope. And I'm going to take my own life. And, and something saved my life that day. What saved my life that day was something that has been secret inside of me as far back as I can remember. Something that I loathed and hated about me. And what that's always been is I've always secretly been afraid. I've always secretly been a coward. I covered it up with violence and bravado, I would fight guys where I knew they were going to beat me to a pulp because I'd rather be beaten to a pulp than let anybody know how, how afraid I am. That's how afraid, that's how much I loathed the fact that I was afraid and how much afraid I was of you finding out how scared I was. And yet that morning, that fear saved my life. I absolutely believe a more courageous guy as convinced of the end as I was, would have killed himself. But in God's hands, sometimes the even worse things about us become useful. And I was at the end of my rope. It seemed like there was nothing left to do. And some of you who are sober a while, you might be sitting here thinking, well, that's, that's crazy. My God, Bob, why didn't you go to AA and get a sponsor and work those steps? Well, the tragic thing was that if I would have been able to kill myself, I would have killed myself believing I did AA. Because I'd probably been to 150, maybe 200 meetings through various institutions over a period of almost seven, about seven years. And I would have died thinking I'd done AA, but I never did. I never did what a lot of you are doing. Uh, there, I'll tell you a little story. There's this little kid who lived on a farm in America out in the country. And one day he's out by the highway doing some chores for his father. And he had, they had fence along the front of, of the property where the road was. And he's out there mending this fence. And he looks and he sees this telephone pole. 
And on the telephone pole is a poster, a brightly colored poster for something he'd never heard of, a circus. And there was a circus coming to town. And on the poster it had pictures of, of lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and elephants and clowns and all kinds of stuff. And it was fascinating to him. He didn't know what a circus was, but man, he wanted to go to it. He wanted to see that. And it was a, it was a dollar admission. So he ran back to the house and he said to his dad, Dad, there's a circus coming to town. Man, it's a dollar. If I work hard, can you give me a dollar? Can I go? And his father said, sure, son, you can go. The morning of the circus came and his father gave him the silver dollar, sent him off to town. Well, the kid gets into town and there's a big crowd of people on the main street. But because he's a little kid, he kind of maneuvers his way through the crowd, gets right up onto the curb the edge of the street, and he looks down the street, and there's a parade coming down the street. And there's clowns out in front dancing and juggling things, and amazing stuff. Behind the clowns, there are these whole bunch of elephants with people riding these elephants. He'd never seen anything like that. Then there are wagons with giraffes' heads sticking out of the tops of the wagons, and then wagons with lions and tigers and all kinds of exotic animals, zebras, all kinds of stuff. There are white stallions with people standing on them. And this thing, this is, this is blowing his mind. At the very end of the parade, there's this little clown, clown dancing down the street. And he's got the silver dollar. He doesn't know what to do. He shows this clown the silver dollar. The clown tips his hat. He throws the silver dollar. The clown catches it, bows, and dances down the street. The kid feels great, and he goes home. He goes home thinking he's seen the circus. He's never seen the circus. He saw the passing parade. I spent seven years in Alcoholics Anonymous as part of the passing parade. I never got into the big top. And this tragic thing is I thought I saw the parade. I never saw the parade. I I thought I saw the circus. I only saw the parade. In 1978, after a failed suicide attempt, I ended up in a in a hospital again. I, 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 I'm one of those kind of guys, when I drink, I drink. I get real sick real quick. I don't eat. I get sores that won't heal. I'm not against eating. I'm just not going to eat up my drinking money. And I'm that kind of guy. I, I have always, when I start, burn my life to the ground. I'm that guy. You know that thing they talk about in our book, in the doctor's opinion, the allergic reaction to alcohol? I've had that that phenomenon of craving since day one. I've always been the guy that when he drinks and starts to feel that buzz, that feeling from the alcohol, I break out in an irresistible yearning to get higher. And because of that, if I'm still conscious, I ain't done partying. Matter of fact, I remember being at a, a party up in Boston over the holidays with a bunch of guys. and Good party. We were drinking and drinking and drinking. It was great. Some guy came through with a bunch of capsules. I didn't even ask him what they were. I just said thank you. Took a bunch of them. Turned out to be animal tranquilizer. Well, in about 45 minutes, I'm laying on the floor. I can't get up, but I'm still awake, so I'm trying to talk people into bringing me a drink. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the guy I am. If I'm still awake, I ain't done. There's a, there's a test. Some of you guys might be new. There's a test in our book that really is a good test that defines alcoholism. You know, you, sometimes you go to treatment today, they ask you crazy questions in treatment. They ask you the wrong questions. They'll ask you, what's your drug of choice? What do you got? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean, I drank vanilla extract in a pinch. I mean, I, <laughs> right? It got bad enough. I might drink your shaving lotion. I don't know. I mean, I, I smoke banana peels. I mean, I try anything in a pinch. You know, I, don't ask drug of choice. What they should ask me is, what happens to you, Bob, when you when you pick when you drink one or two drinks? The test in the book says, if you're not sure you're an alcoholic, he says, go down to the nearest pub and try some controlled drinking. You've got to drink and then stop abruptly. 
It says, try it more than a few times. See what happens. I remember in the old days, years 25, 30 years ago, watching old-timers in AA offer money to new guys that weren't sure if they were alcoholic and say, here, go find out. I haven't seen that in a long time because our society is up to the ante on the possible, or the possible cost of that experiment. And, I, and it's not a good, it's really not a viable test, I, I think, if you're like me. Because let's say, let's say you're going to go down here to the pub. All right, I'm going to see if those AA people are right. I'm going to have two drinks and that's it. And then I'm going to shut her down. I've got to go home. Now, you can't smoke nothing, take nothing, nothing. Two drinks, that's it. Well, about halfway through that second drink, it's going to become very apparent to me that this is a bad test day. Because there'd be some a girl there I got, I'd have to have a drink with. The game would be on. You know, the game. Oh, my God, that game can't leave now. Some guy would come in, always have something good to smoke. Oh, I can't get to be with Joe. Joe's got, I can't, not, can't go now. Bad test day. Tomorrow, be a better test day. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'd go in there to take the test. Halfway through that second drink, something comes over me. It's a yearning just for, and it uses my own mind against me, and it punks me out because I think the neck one more drink is my idea. I don't know that it's an allergic reaction to alcohol that creates a yearning and a craving for more of a feeling in me, and it uses my own mind against me and all my ability to rationalize to make me think that it's my idea to have well, one more. Do you ever notice how you, you go into a bar to have two drinks, and about through the, halfway through the second one you realize that two wasn't the right number? Which what, three, three, three is really. It's, every drink I've ever taken has made me think that one more drink was absolutely all right. One more drink, it's just... One more is fine. And I don't know, I, I don't know that I have that. But consequently, because I have that, every time I pick up a drink, I'm in trouble. And maybe not the first day. But one of the connections that I was hard, I could not make, because I get this tunnel vision sometimes, is that the first drink is always connected and cannot be separated from the end of the run where you wished you were dead. And you hate yourself. You cannot separate. See, I, I can see the first, the possibility of a little bit of fun in the beginning, but it's always connected to the other. Um, and so, uh, by, by 1978, I have tried this experiment over and over again. I have thrown every other chemical or medication into the mix, hoping to jumpstart a party that couldn't be jumpstarted. As it talks about in our book, uh, I'm a guy that has this illusion that someday, some way, with the right set of circumstances, I'll be able to control and enjoy a party that I haven't been able to capture in a couple years. And I've never really been able to control it. I was, uh, over the years, things started getting worse and worse and worse. I, I, I didn't know that I had a progressive illness. I, I thought I had, like, progressive bad luck or something. I mean, it was just, because every, it seemed like every year it was worse. And I'd find myself, you know, it's like you, you look around you one day and it's, you're with people that you wouldn't have a year before. You wouldn't have even wanted to be around, and now they're your, they're your only friends. And then a year later, you realize those people now are up here. They won't talk to you anymore. You've lowered your. And towards the end of your drinking, if you're like me, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting levels of demoralization quicker than I can lower my standards. I mean, it's just it's going down quick. And I. Uh, when my, when my mother and father uh, cut me off, my mother and father loved me. And they were not alcoholics. I had a good family. But I broke their hearts so many times that uh, for their own survival, they had to just go. get. They just, I was not welcome in their house. They would not take my calls. It was, it was, they, were done, they were done with me. And uh, when that happened... I had no one to bail me out when I was really in trouble. And I ended up on the streets. I ended up a homeless guy. 
Um, and I'll tell you one little story. I was, I was sleeping on this guy's couch. You know, I was homeless for about three years. I never thought I was, though. Because I could periodically find somebody, somebody to feel sorry for me and let me sleep on their couch. Or, or I'd go into a halfway house or I'd spend a couple nights at the Salvation Army. Even on the rare occasions where I was actually sleeping in an abandoned building or in the park, I wasn't really homeless. I was an urban outdoorsman. You know, kind of in the Jack Kerouac spirit, you know. Well, during this period, I, I'm staying on a guy's couch. And uh, I, here, I, here's how I come to. I come to with the tremors, bad, bad tremors in the morning. And I, and I have them until I can get some of that medicine in me, and it's bad. And usually I come to so sick that I grab myself like this and sit on the edge of that sofa and rock back and forth trying to get myself together. Trying to just get up enough stamina and courage to go out there in that world and get myself another jug and, or hustle the money to get one. Because sometimes, I'd, sometimes I'd, I'd have some change and some money and sometimes I would. This particular morning, uh, I rummaged around. I found a couple rolled up, crinkled up bills in the bottom of my dirty pants and a bunch of change that was scattered around on the floor and some of it's underneath the sofa. And I put it all together and I had enough, I had enough money for a half gallon of uh, cheap wine. And the wine I drank, when I say use the word wine, I use it loosely. This wine's never seen a grape. I mean, this is... This is <laughs> 20% alcohol, and if you read the ingredients, it says grape flavoring and neutral spirits. I mean, it's... <laughs> but I got enough money for a half gallon of that stuff, and... which means that I'm going to be able to get w at least somewhat well that morning. And I go to the liquor store, and I got the bottle, and I'm coming out. Now I'm looking for an alley to duck down so I can get well, drink some of that stuff to stop this. And then this woman who knows my mother and father cuts into me. And I don't want to talk to her. Because I'm a mess. You know, I got, I got hair down to here and it's all, it's all you know, I don't bathe, right? You know, because I don't really care anymore. And I, I'm just a mess. And she cuts into me and she says, uh, how's your dad? I don't know. I haven't talked to my father in a long time. She says, uh, I hear he's in the hospital and he's, he might, he's dying. Oh, man, don't tell me that. Oh, man, don't tell me that. You see, me and my father have some unfinished business. I really broke his heart, and I hurt him. And the idea of him dying without me at least being able to go and talk to him is, oh, it's making me sick here. And I got away from her. I drank a bunch of that wine to kind of steady my feelings down, my, my shakes down. And, and uh, also this, this new information is driving me crazy. And I had enough change left over to go to a phone booth. And I went to this phone booth and I called my mother. And oh, she answers the phone when she hears my voice. It's like, what do you want? You know, and I, I tell you, that's kind of what you get if you break, no matter how much somebody loves you, you break their heart enough, you get what you want. Sometimes you get a hang-up. And I said to my mom, I said, I hear Dad's sick and he's in the hospital. And she gets quiet. And she says, yeah. She says, I don't know if he's going to make it. Oh, man. I told her, I said, i, I, I got to go see him. I need to see him. Where, where can I see him? Where's he at? She won't tell me. She says to me, she says, you can't see him. I said, Mom, i got to see him. I really need to talk to him. I can't even describe the well of, of, of guilt and remorse I got inside me for the things I've done to my dad. She says, you can't see him. I know how you are. It will hurt you. It will hurt him to see you the way you are. I started backpedaling. I said to her, I said, Mom, listen, please, I need to see him. I promise you I'll get cleaned up. I'll trim my beard. I had this scraggly. I'll trim my beard a little bit. I'll get some clean clothes and I'll take a shower. I will be sober. I promise you. And she said to me, she said, you can't fool around with that. He'll know. If you're, if you're even high a little bit, he'll know. And he, he could. My dad had the ability, when I wasn't even very high, to tell on the other end of the phone I was high. Now, I don't know how he did that, but he could do that. 
She said, you can't fool around with this. And I promised her. I said, Mom, I promise you I'm not going to drink. I'll go see Dad tomorrow. She told me the one, one of the three hospitals, which hospital he was in. He was in the intensive care unit up there. And I go home and I finish up the, that bottle of wine. I ended up partying with some guys and doing some stuff. And I come to the next morning and I'm going to go see my dad. Well, the problem is I come to the next morning and I got those bad tremors. And I got that fear on me. And I'm sitting on the edge of that sofa and I'm rocking back and forth and I'm thinking about going over to that shiny, clean hospital with all those square people and they're going to be looking at me. And it's making me crazy. And i got to see my dad, but man, I'm just in terror of going over to that hospital. And I don't know what to do and I'm locked up inside myself and I... I uh, I started having a conversation with myself. And i got to tell you, an alcoholic having a conversation with himself is in a lot of trouble. And the conversation goes something like this. Well, man, the way you're shaken, it wouldn't be good for your father to see that. You know, they can't smell vodka on your breath. Bob, what you need is you need about... Just not a, you don't want to get not to get drunk, but you need just about a half of a half a pint, just a half of a half a pint, just to stop this. You can eat some of those menthol eucalyptus cough drops. Throw your room. The guy you're staying at's got some cologne and visine in his bathroom. You can use some of that stuff. They won't know. You you'll be able to go over and see your dad. Seemed like seemed like a reasonable plan. Well, I start rummaging around for money, and I got I got three dollars. I got I got actually three one dollar bills and over a dollar and change. So I got over four dollars. Well, you can buy. I only need a half of a half a pint, but you can buy a fifth for the money I got. Now I don't need a fifth. I need a half of a half a pint, but I'm going to need the rest of that fifth after I come back from the hospital. I know that. So I, I thought, well, I'll go get, I'll get a fifth, I'll drink a half of a half a pint, and when I come back from seeing my dad, I'll have that vodka waiting for me, because I'm probably going to need it. And I went and got that fifth, and I'm going to drink that half of the half a pint. The problem is, every drink of alcohol I ever take makes one more drink seem appropriate. Next thing I know, I'm better than halfway through that fifth of vodka, and I'm, now I'm too messed up, and I know it, to go see my dad. And I'm sitting there, and I'm crying. And out in the midst of the despair and the the self-loathing, because I screwed this up, I try to pump myself up. I say, okay, but tomorrow, tomorrow, man, I'm going to come to, and I'm not going to drink anything. And i got to go see. If my dad dies, i got to go see my dad. The problem is the next day came, and it was the same thing. And the day after that, and the day after that, and I am... Ashamed to tell you I never went to see my father. And if you think I didn't love my father, you're out of your goddamn mind. But that's what alcoholism does to guys like me. Is it any wonder that some of us hate ourselves so much at the end we're having thoughts about offing ourselves? Is it any wonder that every time I get sober I sink into a deep depression? Is it any wonder that sobriety and abstinence feels like I'm doing time? when you spend years accumulating a wealth of that kind of stuff? I heard a story a couple years ago that just, I thought it was the best depiction of the progressive nature of alcoholism I'd ever heard. And it was this friend of mine, he told me about a friend of his who had been diagnosed as terminally ill with stomach cancer. Now, I know a little bit about that when. When I was 17 years sober, my mother was diagnosed as terminally ill from cancer. And what the doctors pretty much do is throw up their hands and say, listen, there's nothing we can do for you. You're going to die. Put your house in order. And that's what had happened, and everybody was very sad. Well, a couple months go by, and he hears this rumor that a surgeon has surfaced that's going to operate on him. And he's excited. He thinks, well, well, my God, it's about time. Finally, they found a surgeon that can take the cancer out. And he calls over there excited, you know, thinking, hey, I hear they're going to perform surgery and take the cancer out. And he's told, uh, no, they're not. They're going to do the surgery, but they're not going to take the cancer out. 
He says, well, what are they going to do the surgery for if they're not going to take the cancer out? Well, they're going to cut out sections of his stomach and his intestines and his internal organs to make room for the growth of the tumor so his last days on earth are not excruciatingly painful. Alcoholism is very much like that. If your job or your career gets in the way of the progression of the disease, I'm telling you, alcoholism will cut that out of your life. Your mother and father who love you and you love them, if they get in the way of the progression of the disease of alcoholism, alcoholism will cut them out of your life. Your self-respect, your morals, alcoholism, you'll leave those in the dust. Even your children that you may love more than life itself and time, alcoholism will cut them out of your life. I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of men and women who have lost their children from alcoholism and the government's taken them away. Thank God that most of the time you get to see the miracle of step eight and nine work and and the restoration and redemption. And then finally, when alcoholism's had its way with you and it's taken away everything of any value, then the worst thing happens of all. It just leaves you going on for a while wishing you were dead. I think the worst thing of alcohol, the progression of alcoholism is it gets worse and worse and worse, and then it gets the same. And that's the worst of all. It gets the same. I come to every morning and I'm sick and I'm shaking and I'm desperate, frantic attempt to try to get better and have some kind of good feelings. And the problem is I've wrung all the good feelings out of the bottle. I've, I've wrung all the ease and comfort. I'm, I'm the guy that talks about in a vision for you. It says we, someday you'll get to a point where you won't be able to imagine life with it because it's turned on you. And, and drinking now is pathetic. And yet I can't imagine life without it either. I am really stuck in a trap I can't spring. And that took me to a bridge in 1978. In the progressive nature of this disease. And I, uh, I came off that run uh, 2,000 miles away. I, I was running from the law. I, I was a homeless guy. I was trying to make it to the beaches of California thinking I'd survive another winter because I almost froze to death on the streets of Pennsylvania every time I did... God, winter, I used to winter in treatment centers. Some people go to Bermuda. I go to treatment. <laughs> Which is fine unless you screw up in the treatment center and start sneaking a beer once in a while and they catch you and throw you out and then it's, there's snow on the ground and oh, that's a bad deal. And so I want to get to California so I don't have to go to prison for a couple of years and I, I ended up in a hospital in Las Vegas, Nevada. And they, there's an old saying, the Buddhists say that when the student's ready, the teachers appear. And I remember like yesterday, I sat in those meetings. And for the first time in seven years, I could hear the people there. And I, I thought that they just must have been, the, they just were just amazing people. Uh, the problem is with the difference between the people in Nevada and the people in Pennsylvania was me. See, I couldn't hear the people in Pennsylvania because I got too much of me between me and you. And you know what I mean. You know, when you, you, know, you know what it's like when you come to a meeting and you can't hear anything because you're in your head doing a dialogue of what the speaker, how screwed up the speaker is. And look at that. Look, where did he get that shirt? And oh, my God. What's he? This guy's full of himself. And, oh, you know, you just, you just do that. Just do that. So nothing gets in. I fit the old adage, you can always tell an alcoholic, just can't tell him much. Right? <laughs> there was a great psychiatrist that one time said one of the reasons that, that most of us don't get better is that our egos are so sick that we have an inability to listen in order to hear anything new. We can only listen to see how we're already right. Oh, see, that's me. That's me. And so I'm a closed system. Nothing gets in. In 1978, I'm sitting in these meetings in this hospital, and I could hear you. I had just enough of me kicked out of me that I could finally hear you. And I'm sitting there. I remember it like yesterday. I'm sitting in those meetings. I'm I'm sober about maybe 
physically sober, just as the shakes are kind of gone, and I'm physically doing a little better, and I'm in this meeting, and guys are talking about themselves. They're not trying to tell me nothing about me. They're talking about themselves, and I'm sitting there, and I'm nodding my head, and I'm thinking to myself secretly, oh, my God, I'm like these people. And I didn't know that the, the men and women who give of their time in service in Alcoholics Anonymous to take meetings in, into places like that are the cream of the crop. They are our doers. They are our servant, trusted servants. They are the ones who believe in this so much that they'll put their own lives, lives aside in order to help other drunks. I didn't know that the people I was meeting in those places were the cream of the crop. I didn't know that. See, I'd sat in meetings in Pennsylvania with people that, looking back, I think some of them might not have even been alcoholic. Because their whole solution to alcoholism is something I tried to emulate desperately. You just don't, I, I just don't drink no matter what. I do that very well right up into the day I drink. <laughs> I had a sponsor for about a month or so in Pennsylvania. I... I actually got him for bad motive. I thought he'd get me a good job or help me to get some, some kind of financial. Because he had a nice, big, expensive car and he seemed to be doing very well. But, but he wasn't an alcoholic of my type. He was sober a long time and very happily on a three-step program of recovery. Step one, don't drink. Step two, Go to meetings to fill the social void that used to be filled by going to the bars and parties. And step three, sell Amway. And I tried, I tried his program of recovery, and I'm drunk within a couple weeks, right? But it worked very well for him. But I am not the type of alcoholic that he was. His drinking problem ended where the bottle ended. My alcoholism starts when I stop drinking. And I didn't know that. But I'll tell you, I was so, I'll tell you, whatever the power is behind this curtain that we see as life was really out to help me. This thing I've come to understand and call God. I was, the, I put, I had people put in my life that were very involved in service. I'm, my, the guy that became my sponsor had been a past delegate. He was one of the co-founders of the, of a big convention in Las Vegas. He was involved. I mean, he'd been involved. If there was anything in AA that had to be done, he'd had his fingers in it at some time. He just was service, service, 12-step call, service, 12-step call. He started pushing me into doing stuff that made no sense to me. They had me get cleared at two months sober to start going into the state penitentiary. You couldn't even do that today. Today you have to have two years. And I just, I've been grandfathered into the state penitentiaries in Nevada for, for over 30 years. And I started going into those meetings. I, I started going into taking meetings into the detox that I just came out of. I started going on 12-step calls. And I'm doing this with a little bit of protest. I would do it, but I always had to tell them how I felt about it. And thank God they never really cared. They just listened, but they, they never really cared too much. You know, they just, yeah, 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 just do it, right? I tried to explain to them. I said, this guy said, you know... I, I know you want me to do all this service in this 12-step work, but I, I kind of feel like I need to work on me first. And he said, you've done quite enough of that. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Just do this stuff. And I started doing it. I became a secretary of a meeting when I, God, I was, uh, it seemed like the group I belonged to, we, were, we had our fingers in it. We were not only active in the home group, but we were helping. There were groups that couldn't get a GSR and couldn't, get a, couldn't even get secretaries. Some of the meetings and clubs, so guys from our group would, say, would just go there and go there, and finally after a while just say, well, I will do it, even though we're not members of this group. And they just do it because we, we grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous with this tremendous ethic and desire to, to say yes, to help, wherever it was needed and without prejudice, without discernment, and without judgment. Just to help. What can I do for AA? And when I was about a year sober, I went to my first um, general service 
area service conference, and I get to meet some really old-timers from the general service office in New York and some trustees that were giving talks. And, and they taught, started, I started going to these workshops on the traditions, and they lit me up. See, I never thought, I always thought the traditions were sort of some kind of rules or something. And I started getting lit up because why would that happen? Because I was starting to fall in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. I heard a trustee say something that I'll tell you, I thought about it over 30 years, probably almost 30 years now, and I thought it was 100, what he said was, was really right. Now, maybe the statistics are not exact. But, what he, but the, the, the spirit of what he said, I know, is right on the money. He said that he believed that 95% of all the service in Alcoholics Anonymous was done by 5% of the people. And he said that, that 5% has the highest recovery rate, staggering way above the whole rest of the fellowship. And my sponsor told me, he said, there's two kinds of people in AA. There's doers and there's judgers. And the doers are too busy to judge much and the judgers are too busy judging to do much. And he said, stick with the doers. Stay away from the judgers. And I I just have been entrenched in service in Alcoholics Anonymous nonstop. I've never taken a vacation. Why would I? Why would I take a vacation from something that lights me up? That does very slowly what alcohol used to do for me very quickly. Helping drunks is the thing that does it for me. It lights me up. Some of you know that. Those of you that sponsor people, you know how that, that, that deal is. I didn't know that... Uh, That being of service in Alcoholics Anonymous makes you stand up and be part of that 5%. And as part of that 5%, you're a target. Everyone who doesn't want to do anything wants to just be a wheelchair general and judge everything that the doers do. And I'll tell you, I I went through a period for about about five or seven years sober till I was about 12 years where it just, man, I'll tell you, it bothered me. People would be taking shots at me. They'd be making up stories about me that weren't even true. I would tell them, listen, I got some true stuff that's really good. You don't have to make stuff up. Really, really, trust me. The true stuff is bizarre. It's really a lot better than the crap you're making up. Trust me. But they won't. They don't listen. I said, talk to my sponsor. He'll give you some real dirt on me. You don't have to make nothing up. And I was up, uh, when I was drinking at one point, I took a, uh, a geographic, I went up to the state of Maine, and I was kind of, had some, the law was, I was in trouble, I was up there hiding out, and I got a job working on a lobster boat, and I'd never been on a lobster boat, and I was, a, my job was a stern man. I was pulling traps. It's hard work. I mean, you're pulling those traps nonstop all day long. And in the lobster boats, when you pull the traps out, sometimes, that sometimes there's a whole bunch of crabs in there. Now the lobster man don't want the crabs, so they got this big bucket about this high, and about this big around on the deck of the boat. And as, the, as you pull the lob, you put the lobsters in the bins and you throw the crabs in the bucket. Well, after a while, there's a couple hundred crabs in there. And I'm, I'm standing there looking at the, pulling traps. I'm looking at the crab bucket. And these crabs are about to spill out of the bucket all over the deck. I'm telling you. Because there's, there's hundreds of them. And now they're climbing up the side. And they're right there. I mean, any second now they're going to start spilling over the deck. And I say to this guy, I say, hey, you've you got to cover this. He said, no, we don't. I said, you're going to have crabs all over the deck. He says, no, we won't. I said, I'm telling you, I'm watching. It's going to happen any second now. He says, no, it won't. He says, Watch. And I'm watching, and I saw, there's, he's getting out, and just as a crab 
would start to go over the edge, it would drive the other ones crazy and he'd pull, they'd pull him back down. And none of those crabs could ever get out. You got sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous, you got a crab bucket. When it says, are we willing to go to any lengths? Are you willing to put the principles and the ethic of service and the 12 traditions in your life ahead of even your own personality that sometimes gets shot at? Are you willing to serve something greater than yourself? Because that's what we do here. And in the big picture and in the long run, um, things happen. Those of us that stay in the trenches and try to help other drunks, we... We get a glorious life. And one of the reasons it's glorious, it's not so much that everything works in our life and we become successful. And that's kind of a a byproduct. When you get the insides well, the outsides work real well. It's cause and effect. But probably more important than that, to be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous and to help other drunks, it's like having a ringside seat for the greatest show on earth. You will get to be up close and personal with men and women who are absolutely hopeless, who have ruined their life, and you'll get to see people get their children back who were convinced when they got sober they'd never see their kids again. You'll get to see men and women who are so emotionally and mentally screwed up that they, you think they should be in a mental hospital on medication for the rest of their lives, and in a couple of years you'll see them sponsoring people And the lights will be on and they'll be laughing and they'll be free. And it's only through the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. We see crazy stuff every day. Homeless people who were living in the bushes by their first house. We see stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis that Hollywood would want to make a mini-series out of. Matter of fact, I think we get blasé to it after a while. I I overheard a conversation not too long ago with it. Somebody was talking about so-and-so Pete, or or I forget, I think his name was Pete. He used to live in the bushes or down on the field behind the the TIE club, and and he was buying a house, and and this guy's telling about, hey, he's buying a house. He's buying his first home. Remember the homeless guy? He's buying his home. The guy went, yeah, yeah, where's the sugar? We get blasé to that stuff. Um, I... uh, I didn't know, really, I didn't get it for a while, why, why you were having me do some of the things that you were having me do. Because I don't, I'm, a, I'm slow sometimes with cause and effect. One of the first uh, things that was ever told for me to do, I was just out of, the, out of the detox, and I'm at this meeting, and I'm sober maybe four weeks four, four and a half weeks, and this old-timer corners me, and he says to me, he says, you're "You're pretty new, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. And looking back, he could tell that I looked like I didn't really feel like I fit. So he said to me, he says, we got a job for you. You're You're the only guy in the room that's new enough that you can really remember the awkwardness of coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and what it feels like to be new. He said, we want you to look for the new people and try to make them feel welcome. And you might be the only one that can do that because, see, we've we've been sober so long we forgot. You can let him know that there's somebody in this room that knows how he feels. And I thought, I can do that. I know how he feels because I'm still feeling it. Right, And I started doing it. And i got to tell you something. I don't know if I ever made anybody feel comfortable and be a part of AA, but I'll tell you something I felt comfortable and a part of. And in no time at all, I was, I, this was my place. And everything that they had me do in Alcoholics Anonymous was for reasons like that. And I didn't see it for a long time. I, I'm, hit, I'm doing all these hospitals and institution meetings. I'm going on 12-step calls. I'm doing all this crazy stuff. And I, I, and I don't know why I'm doing it. And one night, I came home. Uh, 
from my second meeting of the day, and I had uh, talked to my sponsor. I'd prayed that day, and I'm sitting on my sofa. I'm sober maybe a, a, over a year, and I'm sinking in this, to this depression. There's something weird about me that I'm one of those kind of guys, If you, I can be doing fine, but if I go somewhere and just sit and just kind of ponder my life, I've never done that and came away joyous. I've never done that. I've never really got into me and felt wonderful about that. And I'm thinking, as I'm pondering my life, I'm realizing that the last the relationship that just broke up, I'm probably never going to find another one. It's never going to be any good. This job is a nowhere job. And I, there's people sober less than I am that are making more money than me. And I'm never going to have anything. And I've got to make all these amends. I saw a guy at the club. He said he didn't even make amends. He's got a big new car, and I don't got nothing. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I'm getting into it, right? And... I'm sinking into this abyss of depression. It's, it's horrible. And I don't know what to do. And, and I, uh, you know, the one thing about self-pity, and it's really, I, I, sometimes I'll use the word depression, but it's not really depression, it's self-pity. I never liked the word self-pity, though. I like the word depression. You can, if you're diagnosed with depression, you can go to a bar with depression and tell people, I got clinical depression. They'll they'll buy you a drink. They don't buy you nothing for (laughs) self-pity. They'll give you pills for depression. They don't give you crap for (laughs) self-pity. So I like depression better. It's more, doesn't sound as hinky as self-pity. Don't you hate self It's just the word self-pity. Do you ever have somebody come up when you look a little down and say, are you feeling sorry for yourself? <laughs> no, but you will after I hit you. Oh, I hate that. So, I, but I'm sinking into. I'm just feeling sorry for myself. I'm really getting into it because I don't. I don't just get into stuff. I drink of my emotions like I drank whiskey. I do it obsessively, and I just get that stuff right here. And I'm sinking into this abyss. It's horrible. When you're full of self-pity and you're drinking, it's almost warm and mushy. Sober, it's not. It's bad, man. It's bad. And I'm, uh, I don't know what to do. I feel like I weigh a thousand pounds laying on, sitting on that couch. I look at the clock and there's a meeting not too far from my uh, apartment at a quarter after ten. And it's going on ten o'clock. And I, I think if I could just... If I could somehow get off this sofa and get to that meeting, maybe something will snap me out of it at that meeting. Maybe I'll hear something. And I I said a little prayer, and somehow I muscled myself off that sofa. It was hard. Because when I get really, really down, it's like I sag. I shuffle out to my car like a mope. I got that burdened look. I'm into it, and I really get into it. I don't, when I get depre- when I get full of self pity, I think my hair gets feels sorry for itself. Everything does, just as get you know. And I get I drive up to the meeting, and there's a parking space right in front of the doors to the chapel where the meeting is. And I park right there and I go in and I'm sitting in the back of the room, but I can't hear anything because I'm so self focused and self absorbed that what's going on in the in the meeting is like music in a doctor's office. And that's what happens with spiritually sick people. We reverse our relationship with reality. Healthy, awake people, they're right here. They're very in touch with what's going on. They're awake. They're, li- they're here and every- they're right here. The chatter in their head is very distant. They don't even pay any attention to it. It's like music in the doctor's office. You get real sick, you reverse that. What's going on in reality becomes very distant because the big show's on the inside. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just up in here. So nothing's getting into me. Well, there's a guy sitting across from me who's coming off a drunk, and he is in bad shape. He's got the bad tremors, and he's, he's grabbing himself and rocking back and forth like he wants to fly apart, and then periodically gets up and he's pacing back and forth behind me. And then he goes into the bathroom, and he's periodically in there throwing up and and I got a lot of my life is crap, and I got a lot of problems, and I'm trying to figure them out. And this guy's just annoying me to death. I'll tell you, 
can't even think about myself properly with him involved. <laughs> By the end of the meeting, I have not, it, the meeting has not helped me. As a matter of fact, I, I feel kind of worse because it was one of those meetings where everybody's very up and doing very well and the subject was gratitude and then there's me. You know, one of those kind of meetings. And I don't know what to do. So I stay after the meeting and I help this guy, Charlie, who's the secretary with the chairs and the trash because I've been indoctrinated to do that kind of stuff in AA. And um, Charlie and I are the last two guys to leave the chapel. And Charlie's on his way to work. He's locking up and we're standing there. We look over and the guy that was coming off the drunk is laying on the ground and curled up in a ball in front of my car. Now, I'm going to have to almost step over him to go home and ponder my problems more deeply, which is what I really want to do, except Charlie's there. And Charlie's got a big mouth and he'll tell my sponsor if I don't go help this guy. And, you know, and Charlie's, are you going to go help this guy? I don't want to help this guy. I want to go home and think. But I, I don't know what to do. So I go over to the guy. He's a mess. He, he's peed his pants. He stinks. He's, he's got bad tremors. He's afraid he's going to go into to convulsions and seizure. You know, seizure. He has he, inconsidered. He has no medical insurance or money, so we could take him into a treatment center. There's only one thing to do with a guy like that, and that's take him up to the county hospital. I've been up there before, and they'll take him eventually because of the government money they get. But they, I'll tell you, I've been up there with drunks before. They, they treat you bad. they got a bad attitude towards alcoholics. They'll make, they'll make you wait sometimes with these poor drunks for five, six hours. They, it almost, they, they, like they would rather treat legitimately sick people than these self-induced guys that are probably going to be back here in a couple weeks anyway. And I know, I've been up there before, I know what's coming, I'm going to be there all night, five, six hours. i got to go to work in the morning. i got this idiot in my car, and I'm driving up to this hospital, I am not happy about this. I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm, going to, I'm not going to get any sleep, I'm going to be tired, I'm going to go to work in the morning, I'm going to have a bad attitude, I'll probably get in a fight with my boss, lose my job, and it's a lousy job anyway. <laughs> Isn't it bad enough that my life's crap? I have to do this too? Doesn't anybody else step, step up to the plate they except me? But I don't say any of that. I'm just driving. Get to the hospital park. And pull, get this guy inside. We get him to sign up on the sheet. Sitting down in the waiting room. and He's coming apart at the seams. He's in bad shape. And he, we're sitting there for a long time, and he starts to talk to me. And he's almost on the verge of tears. And he tells me that for some time now, he hasn't been able to even drink away the shame and the remorse that he is overwhelmed with from the things he did to the people who loved him. He told me that for some time, he's been wishing he had the courage to kill himself and hating himself for the fact that he doesn't. He really, then he really got me. He said, he said to me, I don't know why you're wasting time with me. I'm not like you people in AA. You see, I always drink again. And he's telling me about me. And somewhere in the wee hours of the morning, I fell in love with that guy. I don't know why. He can't get me a better job. Chances are he's not even going to stay sober a year and give me some sort of credit for something. Except that he had and suffered from alcoholism exactly like I suffered from alcoholism. I remember sitting there in that waiting room and in my heart I wanted him to be okay probably more than I wanted me to be okay. I fell in love with the guy. I wanted him to be all right. It was years later that I realized what had happened through sponsoring guys, that what I had fallen in love with was I, I fell in love with the me that was in him. An aspect of me that I could never, ever love directly. I had to love it through loving you. I know. I had a therapist one time, very big on, you got to love yourself. Love yourself, she said. She gave me these positive affirmations I was supposed to look stand in front of the mirror and look myself in the eye and say over and over again, God loves me, God forgives me, God accepts me, 
I love me, I forgive me, I accept me. What a bunch of bullshit. I could have stood there and said that till the, till the planet blew up and it wouldn't have changed how I felt about myself and Ill at all. But how odd that all the rest, all the rest, restoration, the whole change between me and me happened from me helping you and making amends to everyone I hurt. That's how it started to change for me. And they finally admitted that guy into that uh, hospital. They gave him a bed, and, and I'm I'm driving home, and it, it's it's the sun's coming up. It's early in the morning. And I'm driving home, and I'm crying. But I'm not crying because I'm depressed. I'm crying because I felt so complete and so right about my life. It was like everything past and present all made sense to bring me to a point where I realized this is what exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. It was like there was, it was, there was a oneness. It was just an amazing thing. I felt the presence of a God that I had never connected with consciously, but yet had come to believe in because I saw evidence of his, of his hand in my life. And I, I, felt the, I felt a conscious presence in that car driving home. And I've got to tell you something. There's a big difference between faith and this thing we talk about in AA called conscious contact. Some of you, when you leave the meeting tonight, you'll get in your cars and you'll drive home. And you'll drive home with absolute faith that there are police out there. You better drive the way you're supposed to or they're going to pull you over. Total faith. You get one in your rear view mirror with his lights on, you've got conscious contact. And there's a big difference between faith and conscious contact. And that, I had faith up to that point, but that morning I had conscious contact. There's a line in step 11. It says, still being inexperienced and having just made conscious contact, we shouldn't be pres presumed to be inspired at all times. The problem with that is, is I've always, it's always, I've just made because that stuff doesn't last. You connect. It's like the tides. It, come, it comes in and it goes out. And it comes in and it goes out. There are days... There are days, especially sometimes after listening to a fifth step, there, I've had times in Alcoholics Anonymous, I think I should get a tent and a tambourine. <laughs> Save some souls. And there are other days, it's like I'm just hoping God's there because I feel desolate. And, and, and you know, the days I'm connected, I do the exact same things that I do on the days I'm not. I don't change the game plan. We lose a lot of people because either too good or too bad, and they change the game plan. I've never changed the game plan here. I do the same things today in my life that I did back in 1978. I turn my consciousness towards this power every morning and every night. I have a sponsor, and I, more importantly than having a sponsor, is that I remain sponsorable. You can have the best sponsor in the world, and if you're not sponsorable, it's, it's meaningless. And I'll tell you something, I think the opposite's true. I think you can have a, a kind of a lukewarm sponsor, and if you're sponsorable, I'll tell you something, God will work through that sucker. He'll, he'll say stuff he don't even know. He'll, I'm telling you, he'll... Because where does the power really come from? It doesn't come from the individual. It comes from the guy behind the curtain. Right? And, and those of you who sponsor people, you, I know you've had that experience. It's a wonderful experience. you got some guy that's all distraught, he's all messed up, and you want to help him. You don't have any idea what to say to the guy. And all of a sudden, words start coming out of your mouth. It's like, oh, my God. I don't, I don't, where's that coming from? It ain't coming from me. Some, sometimes this, whatever this thing is that saves our lives seems to work through us to help other people. And I don't know of a more amazing, more lit up feeling than to have been used by that power. 
I, I'll tell you something. I, I, I've, I've chased happiness all my life. I've found it from bits and pieces here and there. I found something in Alcoholics Anonymous that's much better than happiness. It's usefulness. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness comes and goes. The shine of happiness wears off very quickly if you're like me. But usefulness and serving the purpose that you've been divinely crafted for will let you stick your head on the pillow at night and go to sleep. And there will be a rightness in your life. I often wondered why the old timers, I would look at them and I'd feel so bad and they looked so good. And they looked like they knew exactly who they were. And I didn't know who the hell I was. I've been so many things to so many people, I was lost. And they knew, looked like they knew exactly what their life was about. Because they did. My name is Bob Alcoholic. I've been saved from an alcoholic death and divinely crafted by my own personal mistakes pain, misery, and defects to help guys just like me. I can't help everybody, but I'm real good with guys like me. And it doesn't matter because in Alcoholics Anonymous, we got a wrench for every nut. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.